Okay, so, uh, so let me uh, start today's lecture. So can you hear me over there? If you cannot hear my voice, raise your hand. Okay, so everybody can hear me, very good. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm gonna talk, tell you about the complex manifold today. So complex manifold are manifold that are parameterized by complex coordinates. So I guess you know about uh, complex variables and uh, uh, analysis in the, of the complex or holomorphic functions. So for example, in two dimension, well, we can start with this two dimensional coordinate x and y, and then we can introduce coordinate z in this combination. And then there are lots of beautiful things happens if you consider a class of functions that are function of z only. In general, if you consider arbitrary smooth function in two dimension, it can be a function of both x and y. And on the other hand, if you, uh, so, so this will be some special case of such function. So in particular, that this is a function only of z, means that derivative with, with respect to z bar should vanish. And so this implies some particular differential equation. Because, uh, well, we can write del del z as del del z bar in terms of the original coordinate. You can write it as del del x minus i of del del y. If I didn't make mistake, they, they are the same thing. And similarly, you can write it in this way. So then, you can think of this as some differential equation on the function y, f, which is a function of x and y. So you might have run this as cauchy riemann relation. If you decompose f into the real part and the imaginary part, then this will tell you that this is equivalent to the cauchy riemann relation. And in particular, for example, f is uh, 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 holomorphic, then it is harmonic function, that is Laplacian acting on f is zero. Conversely, you can prove in the case of two dimension that any solution to Laplace equation is sum of holomorphic function and uh, its complex conjugation. So those are the things that uh, probably uh, you should know about uh, a two-dimensional complex plane and the uh, class of functions called holomorphic functions on the plane. So we'd like to do that. We would like to extend this notion to manifold. And uh, so what do we mean to introduce complex coordinates on the manifold? Well, obvious thing that we would notice is first of all, if the dimension of the manifold uh, is odd, then it's something very hard to do because you'd like to pair up each real coordinate into single complex coordinate. So that means that dimension of the manifold, which I have been denoting as n, has to be even so that coordinates can pair up. Okay, so now if you have manifold m, then what it means is that you can cover that by this coordinate patch. And uh, in e uh, at each coordinate chart, you have a map of that into some Euclidean space. So x1, x2, x2m in this case. We have even number of coordinates. I'm assuming that there are even number of coordinates. Okay? So now, so natural thing that for you to do could be that if you want to think of complex manifold, you try to construct complex <coughs> coordinates by combining these two m real coordinates into m complex coordinate. So we can say, well, we can, that's not so difficult. We can just say z1 is equal to x1 plus i x2. z2 is equal to x3 plus i x4, etc. And z, in this case, you have 2m coordinate. So we can say that m is equal to x of 2m minus 1 plus i of x2m. OK, so voila. There are two m complex coordinates, and then we can use that to say that we have complex manifold. Okay. That's not so good. Yes, please. Why do you have a one over z? Uh, one over z. Uh, sorry, never mind. This is this is oh okay. So this is two. This is two, 
and this is z. These are z. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So 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 you might try to do something like that. But those, this is not good enough. This is not good enough. Why it's not good enough? Because it depends on the choice of coordinates that you choose. Well, so so this we have chosen this particular coordinate, but we could have chosen some other coordinate. So for example, you can have some other coordinate such u tilde, which maps this region into some other uh, region of the Euclidean space, which may be y1 to y2m, for example. So, so there, there can be some overlapping region like that. So at this, in this overlapping region, there must be smooth coordinate transformation, which sends these m sets of coordinate, two m sets of coordinate, to another two m sets, to, uh, another set of coordinate y, and there is a smooth coordinate transformation. But there is no guarantee that such coordinate transformation is holomorphic. So we can introduce another set of coordinates, w1 is equal to y1 plus i, y2, etc. wm is equal to y, 2m minus 1 plus i, y, 2m. So we have, a, we have this coordinate, z1 to zm, and w1 to wm. Wait, Professor, what does it mean for a multivariable complex function to be holomorphic? So I have not defined it, so I'm going to define it for you. OK? So, so I haven't told you about these, uh, these are holomorphic or not. So I'm going to tell you about it. OK? So, so y are function, y is a function of x. That, and then this has to be smooth function. Okay? So therefore, w, each w, say, uh, wi, would naturally be function of x1 to x2m. And these are obviously holomorphic. Uh, these are obviously, obviously smooth. But if you want if you have complex manifold, it would be nice if all the coordinate transformation can be done holomorphically as well. So what we mean by that is that, so this would be just smooth coordinate change. But if you want holomorphic coordinate change, what we want is that these w's are functions of z, but not Z bars. <coughs> there are two m variables, so I have chosen m combination of them, and I want to say that w is a function of these m z, but not m z bars. So that means that each of these coordinate change, change of coordinate, this transition function, has to satisfy differential equations. Those are del del z bar i of w j equal to zero, where m, i, and j goes from one to m. One, i, and j go from one to, to m. So you have to have these equations satisfied, okay? So this is what I mean by m complex variable defined on m complex functions defined on m dimensional space to be holomorphic. Okay, so these are the conditions. So you want that. But the problem is that, uh, well, if you do it arbitrarily, so if you just choose arbitrary coordinate and this combine this complex co combination, if you choose yet another set of coordinates and do this, there is no guarantee that transition from one to the other can be done holomorphically. So this is just to say that any smooth manifold are not complex manifolds. That is that we need some structure to the manifold. We need to introduce something more to the manifold. So, so this, is, this is what we have been doing often in the past uh, lectures also. So for example, we talked about the Riemannian manifold. So there, what we did was to introduce Riemannian structure to the manifold. And what we meant by that is that we start with smooth manifold, but that by itself is not Riemannian. What we need is a metric tensor only. And metric tensor introduces some structure of inner product in the tangent space, etc., and that's called the Riemannian structure. So what we need is the notion of complex structure, which 
helps us to choose coordinates in sort of consistently over the manifold. So what is that structure? So, so I'd like to, so now I'm coming to the very uh, uh, left end of the blackboard for those of you in Tokyo, so they can move the video camera. Uh, so, so we need some structure, complex structure. to define complex manifold. So I'm going to give you an answer to that and I'm trying to justify you, justify why this is an answer. So what I'm going to do, so remember in the case of Riemannian structure, what characterized Riemannian structure is, was a metric tensor, g mu nu, which is a function of x if you choose coordinate such x, then you have rank two symmetric tensor G mu nu, which defines the Riemannian structure. So I'm going to take a similar strategy. So I'm going to say that complex structure is defined by some kind of tensor, but not this kind of tensor, but some other kind. So it's a tensor field, but with mixed index one. So in the case of uh, uh, Riemannian structure, you have these two tensors, the tensors whose indices are just tra transforming just like one form and two forms, but not asymmetric but symmetric. But here you have this kind of mixed kind of tensor. And moreover, I require that this tensor J to satisfy this identity. So essentially, if you, so it's a, it's a it's a 2m times 2m tensor because mu and nu should go from 1 to all the way to 2m. And I require the square of this tensor to be an identity. So in the ten, uh, matrix no notation, I'm saying that j square is equal to minus identity. And there is a nice motivation for that, where in order to define complex structure, complex coordinate, I need to introduce i. And important property of I is that square of I, important property of imaginary unit is that uh, square of I is equal to minus one. So I'm introducing some tensor which mimics this property. And uh, but, so I assume first that we have this tensor defined throughout this smooth manifold. And I'm going to tell you how we can utilize that to define this kind of structure, structure of complex coordinate on the manifold. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, one thing we can say, uh, we notice that is that, uh, well, if you have a tensor like that, it's a, it's a matrix, it's a 2M by 2M matrix, and this gives you some kind of linear map on, say, tangent space. By that I mean the following. So remember, we have this tangent space at each point on the manifold. So it's a point on the manifold. We have a tangent space TP of M. And element of this tangent space was something like V mu del del X mu. So this was the sort of element of tangent space, and tangent vector is therefore parameterized by this uh, v, mu, v mu. Professor, it yep. occurs to me, why do you have to have an even dimension? Or oh, okay, because I wanted to have this complex combination. I understand what the intuition is, but uh, yep. what I'm really struggling with yes. more fundamentally is why does a manifold have to have a well-defined dimension? Okay, well, uh, it has to have the well-defined dimension for the following reason. So remember, so I wasn't sure you, or whether you were uh, in this lecture from the beginning, but when I define the manifold, I require that when you have this coordinate patch U and another coordinate patch U, U tilde, I require that so each of these gives you a continuous map from this to some R to the N, and then you can have uh, a continuous map from this to some other man, uh, Euclidean space R M. Okay, and so these are definition of coordinates. You 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 need you need some kind of something like that to define 
coordinate. And but then they overlap with each other, each other. And I require that change of coordinate can be done but in one to one and invertible fashion. And then moreover, map from here to here has to be differentiable and vice versa. Yeah. That's we use for this uh, manifold. Necessary condition for that is n is equal to m. So that's what I was asking. Yeah. So so therefore, in order for the manifold to be co uh, covered by coordinate patch smoothly, then the dimension has to be the same throughout. Uh, oh, so I guess you need a lot more math to figure out why n has equal m or something. Well, because basically the, tra uh, the, the Jacobian for the change of manifold, change of coordinate, will be zero unless these two are the same. You cannot have differentiable one-to-one -one map from two different Euclidean, sp different Euclidean spaces with different dimensions. Because basically you have more point on the other side than the other side, right? Uh, you cannot, you, 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 you wouldn't say that uh, there is differentiable map between R2 and R. That's, that's what I meant. Okay? All right, so, uh, so where we are? Okay. So, so I wanted to say that if you have this such uh, tensor field, then we can define J a map from TPM to TPM. And that's easy to define because the uh, element of tangent space is this vector B mu. And then since we have this matrix J, we can define this kind of thing. So there is a map, there is a linear map from B to JB, okay? And moreover, this map square to minus one. That's what this implies. <coughs> so, so J square is equal to minus one. Okay, so we have this transformation on the tangent space. So you can ask, well, can we? Well, you, you don't have to ask, but I'm gonna ask whether this can be diagonalized, <coughs> okay? Well, suppose this is diagonalized, then what can, what can happen? Well, if it is diagonalized, then since J square has satisfied this identity, so that means that eigenvalues for J should also satisfy the same identity. So you have to have some number which square to minus one. And so do you have do you know such a number? Well, actually, there are two numbers which do that. That is I and minus I. So therefore, if you have matrix like that, I and minus I appears as its eigenstate, eigenvalue. But there is a problem with that because I is an imaginary unit. So if you start with the tangent space as sort of different, uh, uh, vector space with real coefficient, namely if you re restrict the B to be real numbers, then we cannot solve the equation that JB is equal to IB or JB prime to be equal to minus IB prime. You cannot have solution to such equation if you require V to be real vector, because V is a real, and oh, I didn't say, but J, I assumed were also tensor with real entries, real components. So then we can solve this equation. So what we should do is generalize this tangent space slightly so that we allow C to have complex number, to, to carry complex number. So we do what is called the complexification that sounds like a very intimidating word, but all we mean is that at all, this coefficient v mu to take complex number. So if you take at all v mu to take complex number, then we can solve the equation jv is equal to i, or jv is equal to minus i. Why did you conclude that um, j has to have v at all, all these things with eigenvectors? If you act it twice, what if it takes a vector somewhere else and then back or something? Well, suppose J, B, B is an eigenstate of uh, J. You have this. You do it twice. Then, well, lambda is a number, so I can have, say, lambda J of B. So you have lambda square B. On the other hand, we know J square is equal to minus 1, so you have minus B. But, but you assume that it's an eigenstate. Yeah, yeah, so, so I am saying that all the eigenvalues of J has to satisfy this relation. That's all I said.
So if j you if you diagonalize j, then its eigenvalue has to satisfy the identity that j square is equal to minus one. Uh, so, so, so eigenvalue squared is minus one. So only allowed eigenvalues are i and minus i. So if you complexify the tangent space, which I may complexify tangent space, I may write T P M of C. Yes, you have a question. So why isn't it, it just implied from the coordinates that it's complex? I have I'm getting there. Oh. So I'm assuming we don't know about complex coordinates. Okay? Because I just said that a priori we don't have a way of choosing complex combination. The, the whole problem here is that uh, if you pick real coordinate, then I can choose complex combination to define complex co co coordinate, but that's arbitrary. You could cho have chosen different coordinate and you, ha you could have gotten different set of complex coordinate, and these two complex coordinate may not have nice relation to each other. So we need some guidance to do that. And so I'm trying to I introduce some structure which gives us a guidance to define complex coordinates. So we're getting there. Obviously, once we get there, the, all this structure will come out from that. So what I'm doing is trivial if you write that in terms of complex coordinates. But I'm pretending that I don't know how to do that. So I'm then trying to build that, OK? So on this <coughs> complex by tangent space, you can have uh, eigenvalues i or minus i. And it's actually not hard if you think about it. I, I cannot do it real time here. But it, you can actually show that uh, you, can, you have e e same number, same dimension. So the, the excuse uh, uh, the eigenstate for eigenvalue i and the eigenstate with eigenvalue minus i have the same dimension. You can prove that. So, so you can write this as this plus this, where this is an eigenstate of eigenvalue plus i. And then this is an eigenstate of eigenvalue minus i. And then they have both same dimension, the dimension m, if you like. So you complex uh, dimension m. So you start with uh, uh, a 2m dimensional space and the complex five. And then you decompose that into m dimensional space with eigenvalue i and m dimensional space of eigenvalue minus i. OK. So, so that's good. So then. So, it, so like somebody over there said, if, if I had complex coordinate z1 to z2m, uh, zm, excuse me, then I could have considered something like this, subspace generated by these. So if I use coordinates, that's going to be this kind of combination. So you can consider subspace spanned by this. This will going to be this subspace. And then you can have subspace spanned by this. And then this is going to be the subspace with eigenvalue minus i. And they are sort of complex conjugates to each other. Okay? So this is where we want to land up. Okay? So, but we are not there yet for the following reason. It's, it is true that if you have matrix J which satisfies J squared is called mi minus one, we can use that to decompose tangent space into two parts like that. There, there is this big question of whether we can find, so we want, I want to use this as a guidance to choose such coordinate. Can, question is that, can we always do that? So namely, given this, given this tensor J, can we always find complex coordinate Z so that this space satisfies <coughs> expands the subspace with eigenvalue I and this space satisfies the expands the subspace with eigenvalue minus I? Okay. So that's a question. That's a mathematical question. The answer is no, that you cannot always do that. And uh, so, in fact, uh, there is some kind of condition that J has to satisfy in order for this to be possible. So for this reason, for this reason, 
that this j, j satisfying these conditions alone is not yet called complex structure, but is called almost complex structure, kind of simple naming scheme. So it's called almost complex structure. It's almost complex structure because, well, we are almost there, but we are not quite there yet. That uh, this is necessary, this kind of structure will be necessary to de decompose tangent space into two parts, and we would like this part to be this homomorphic part, but we are not there yet. So this is called almost complex structure. I should tell you that not all even dimensional manifolds admit even almost complex structure. So for example, the famous example that I wrote on this is a four-dimensional sphere. Yes, four-dimensional generalization of this two-dimensional sphere that we cannot even define such J. So actually having such tensor is already some non-trivial thing. But suppose I have that, then we still have to satisfy additional conditions in order for us to be able to find such Z. Okay? So that requires, so, so in order to eliminate almost part, J has to satisfy some differential equation. So that requires some master, I mean, and then in fact this will take us to some direction that is not quite uh, uh, what we want to go. So I'm just going to tell you the answer. So there is this funny combination of J, which I'm going to write, but you don't have to write. It's on the note, and in fact, you, you don't probably even need it in near future. So, so we have this kind of funny combination of J's. combination to be zero. Okay, so we have this funny differential equation with four terms, quadratic in J, with derivative. And it turns out that this differential equation for J is necessary and sufficient in order for us to be able to find complex coordinate Z so that this decomposition of tangent space matches up with this decomposition. Namely, if I say it more sort of systematic way, what I'm going to, so what mathematicians have proven is that, so let's call this equation star. So if J mu nu satisfies this equation star right here, then what this theorem mathematicians have proven uh, says is that, that we can choose coordinate, complex coordinate, that I, so that if you have this basis ZI, if you act J, then uh, it acquires eigenvalue i. And then if you act j on the other one, it acquires eigenvalue minus. Okay. So, so this, so in mathematical, in, in mathematical uh, uh, world, we, you might have, you, you, you often hear the word integrability. Namely that you, you want to have some structure and you want to spread that structure throughout the space. And uh, sometimes you have to satisfy what's called the integrability condition. So this differential equation for J is called, uh, often called the integrability condition for the almost complex structure. Namely, we can integrate this J to identify this coordinate, complex <coughs> coordinate. Okay? So once we identify this complex coordinate, then this J turned out to become something quite trivial. <coughs> that is, that uh, if you write J in terms of this complex component, then all this is saying is that uh, if you write J in the holomorphic, holomorphic coordinate, it is just minus square root, square root of minus one. If it is anti-complex direction, it's minus one. 
and the mixed one are zero. So but I, I put the bars on the indices to mean that these are direction in Z bar. Right? And uh, so for example, these are holomorphic, holomorphic directions, these are anti-holomorphic, anti-holomorphic directions. These are mixed directions. So if you choose complex coordinate in such a way, then if you use these complex coordinates to write matrix J in component, then it would look like that. But in order for us to be able to do that, we have to find the such coordinate J, uh, Z, excuse me, and this is a necessary and sufficient condition for us to be able to do that. What do you mean by the direction of the matrix? Direction of matrix, did I say direction, component of the matrix? So you send in the z or z bar direction, so I'm just wondering what that means. Oh well, I, 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 the only thing I meant is in com the component of the matrix. So you know that uh, 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 if you choose co coordinate x mu, and then you can express mat uh, uh, matrix in terms of this coordinate, then you can, you, if you choose another coordinate y, we define another matrix j mu by coordinate change, which is del x rho, del y mu, del y mu, del x sigma, j rho sigma. So this is how the matrix transform under change of coordinates. So we do, we do that. So suppose we have complex coordinate that's i, then these are function of x. So then we can, for example, this one, for example, right here would be del x mu, del z i, del z j, del x nu of j nu nu. So suppose I'm given this j nu nu in some arbitrary coordinate x, then this condition Oh, I, I forgot to put i bar j bar. This condition you can think of this condition as a differential equation, for example. So maybe, maybe I should make it clear. So what we wanted to find is the following. Suppose I have this coordinate. I want to find a way to combine these two m coordinates into complex coordinate. So complex coordinate obviously then should be a function of all these x's, right? So we need some guidance of finding these co complex coordinates. And J gives you the guidance because the following. Suppose we have this matrix J mu nu in coordinate expressed in this coordinate x. Then what J has to do is the following. So what this new complex coordinate has to do is the following. That, well, this is equal to del. So suppose we change coordinate to z, then, then what we can do is del xi, del Oh, so there z i, excuse me. There z i, there x nu, there x mu, there z j. We can even color code it. So we suppose I color code the complex coordinate by red, then these red coordinates are here. And x is a original coordinate. Then we want that to be minus square, square root of minus one times i uh, j i. And then there are other relations, like for example, if you have mixed one, del z i, del x nu, del z bar j, del x mu, that has to vanish, for example. Now if you look at this, you see that now we are talking about differential equation. These are differential equation for z as a function of x. So question of finding complex coordinates satisfying this equation is a question of finding solution to this nonlinear differential equation. I'm asking whether there are solution to this equation. The problem is that we know that there are examples where there are no solution to that equation. In order for this solution to this equation to exist, J has to satisfy this condition. If there is a mathematical theorem that says that if and only if J satisfies this equation, we are guaranteed to have solution to this equation so that we can find complex coordinate z satisfying this equation. Yes, please. Can you explain why this structure guarantees a homomorphic map to the 
That's your homework number one for today, which I pr can prove that because I have written it over here. So that part is simple. Oh, yeah. Proving this implies this, implies solution to uh, existence of a solution to this is difficult. You have to look it up on the book, or, and, or you can try to prove it, of course. I, I, it's a good thing to do. <laughs> but, uh, but this question that I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to ask right now is a simple one. That is, that suppose I use this guidance to choose com some complex coordinate z. Now, a solution to that may not be unique. There can be more than one way of doing it. And but suppose I <coughs> pick arbitrary solution z in some coordinate patch. So suppose we have a manifold M and uh, suppose we have this coordinate U and then suppose I chose this coordinate Z guided by this J. Now suppose I have yet another coordinate patch B and then I choose W complex coordinate by, guided by this principle. Previously we were worried what happens at this overlapping region? What W look like as a function of Z? This requirement guarantees that this transition function is holomorphic. So this is question number one for this week, to prove this. Okay? Now, this condition is non-trivial. That is, at almost a complex manifold, is not necessarily complex manifold. And there are examples such as six-dimensional sphere. It is known that you can, in that case, unlike the case of four-dimensional sphere, where we don't even have almost complex structure, in the case of six-dimensional sphere, there is almost complex structure. That is that we can have J satisfying this algebraic relation. But it turns out any one of such J cannot solve this equation. So six-dimensional sphere has almost a complex structure, but no complex structure, genuine complex structure. If these J's are constant matrices, what is they the They are point? not. So how do you take their sigma and rho derivatives or so on? Well, so X, J is a function of X, so I can certainly take derivatives. But rho is just this discrete index, right? No, what? Oh, okay, so, 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 so I have been using this notation, which probably I said at the beginning. This is a, this is a derivative operator, this is a symbol for the derivative, partial derivative operator. Okay, so, so that's how we define complex structure. Now, but in physical program, often we have, in addition to complex structure, we already have Riemannian structure that is metric. So often in physics, interesting question is not just having complex structure, but when we have both metric and complex structure. So what happens if we, we have both of them? So suppose we have J, U, U, which is complex structure. So that means that it has to square to minus one, but in addition, satisfies this differential equation so that this complex structure is integrable. And suppose in addition, you have a metric that is a Riemannian structure. So then you can ask, uh, well, we can try to have both of them, but then we want to have some kind of compatibility condition. And uh, a manifold, manifold having both of them together with some, some compatibility condition between them is called a Kähler manifold. So now I'm going to tell you about Kähler manifold. OK, so what are the compatibility conditions that we are going to consider? OK, so I'm going to require two compatibility conditions. 
one condition is that covariant derivative of uh, this complex structure tensor is zero. Well, it's a natural thing to do. So in the last week, uh, we introduced a notion of a covariant derivative of a tensor. So, so in general, in the curved space, we cannot just take derivative of a tensor, because if you do that, you don't get tensor, but you get something that transforms in a very funny way. But if you have a metric, we can introduce what we call affine connection, the Christopher symbol, which we can use to define covariant derivative, generalized notion of partial derivative that works in the manifold in such a way that this still transforms the tensor. If we want compatibility condition between complex structure and the Riemannian metric, it's natural to impose this condition. In fact, in the affine tensor, one of the characteristics of affine connection is that metric tensor is covariantly constant. That was one of the conditions. The other condition was that uh, torsion tensor is equal to zero. So, in anal analogy, this is a natural condition to impose. And the other condition that uh, I would like to impose, which is sort of not, a, sort of not less obvious why we have to do it, but uh, this leads to a nice structure, is that uh, the square of uh, J contracted with the metric tensor reproduces the metric tensor itself. So this is another condition. Okay. So, uh, so in fact, uh, the, this is you can think of this as a definition of Kera manifold. Kera manifold is a manifold with both complex structure and Riemannian metric in such a way that metric tensor and the complex structure satisfies this compatibility condition. Should one of those rows be a sigma? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Thank you. conditions. Okay? Okay, now, so we can try to write these conditions in terms of complex coordinates. So suppose we have complex, so we, I'm assuming J satisfies this integrability condition, so I have, I'm entitled to introduce complex coordinates. So suppose I, I use a complex coordinate, then these two say, uh, uh, requirements can be stated in the following way. So let's call this first statement as one, and second requirement two. So then the second requirement implies that this metric tensor, which is g mu nu, dx mu, dx nu, in the original coordinate, set of coordinates, can now be expressed as uh, two times g i j bar d x i d x j bar. Namely, the metric has only this mixed component. The condition two is the same condition as saying that g i j is equal to zero and g i bar j bar is equal to zero. You have a question. Um, when you have metric, the man has tensor, does not have to use covariant derivatives or anything? No. In fact, uh, that's it. So, nine, so, so he was referring to this nine house tensor, which is this complicated tensor that I wrote over there. This is called the Dutch, so I'm, I'm not sure whether I can pronounce that correctly, so I shouldn't even. Nine house, a nine house tensor uh, is this condition. In fact, this implies that. So, so you, cannot, you can start, you could have started with almost complex structure, and this implies that, but you don't have to write it. You could write it, and I think that there are minus signs, so they got cancelled out because of the torsionless condition. Uh, professor, in that condition over there, is it necessary that there exists a J that makes that possible, or that that works for all J before you get a holomorphic? I, I, I said that this is a necessary sufficient condition, which it means that if you have a J satisfying this condition, then you can satisfy this condition. You can, uh, you, you, you can solve this equation. Conversely, if you have complex coordinate, it's trivial matter to, to find such j. And that was what the, uh, somebody over there was saying. Because if you have complex coordinate already, then I can just define j to be i for the holomorphic holomorphic component and minus i 
for the anti-holomorphic anti-holomorphism. And that's it. So that's J in complex coordinates, and then that satisfies this equation. Isn't J supposed to depend on X, you said? But that would be a constant, maybe. Yeah. So in this particular coordinate, it becomes constant. It becomes constant. Well, in any case, you say that those conditions imply holomorphicity of the transform between Ws and Zs. Yeah, so that's your homework to do. But is that when there exists a J that does that, or when every J that you can possibly imagine does that? Yes, the second statement is correct, if okay. you can repeat it. Oh, for all J, that statement holds, is supposed to imply that the, the connections are holomorphic? That's true. So, so, what, so the, well, the correct statement is the following. So suppose you have complex structure Z, uh, J. You can take any J satisfy this condition. You can take any two, co co uh, coordinate trans uh, any two complex coordinates satisfying this, uh, this condition for the, that same J. Then the tra coordinate transformation between them is holomorphic. Of course, if you choose different J to define one complex coordinate, one, and if you use one J to define one complex coordinate, if you use the other J, to define another complex coordinate, then the transition between them are not necessarily holomorphic. If you use one fixed J, use that to define complex coordinate, then the coordinate transformation is always holomorphic. Okay? So anyway, so the second po point is this. Now, the first, first condition uh, implies that, uh, oh, okay, so, 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 so before we get to that, uh, so let's see, so where we are, uh, yeah, okay, so, so, so this was the second condition, and uh, if you have this second condition, then it is actually convenient to introduce the following two forms. So metric tensor is a symmetric two tensor, but two form is an anti-symmetric tensor, so I'm going to define the two form in this note in this way. So first I'm going to define it by using general coordinate. But then if I use this uh, 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 coordinate g i j bar, uh, z, uh, sorry, this is z i z j, please excuse me, then this can be written as uh, half of, uh, oh, we don't even need a half, so this can be written as uh, i times d i j bar d z i with d z j bar. Since this is important, so let me write it, transcribe that on the right hand side of the blackboard. So we're going to define the step two form k to be called i times g i j bar d z i with d z J bar. Okay? So this is a two form and it has a name. It's called the Kera form. <coughs> it's called Kera form because this plays a central role in understanding properties of Kera manifold. Okay, so, so so far I have only used the property two, that is that J satisfies this condition. So now I'm gonna use the property number one. The property number one, so actually this is equivalent, but property number one can be stated as saying that this Kera form is closed. Okay, so, so remember that we have this definition of exterior derivative operator <coughs> acting on the fo differential form, and D acting on K is equal to zero. Uh, in component, if you want to write it in component, that is the same as a condition that del I, G, J, K bar is equal to del J G I K bar and del <coughs> J bar, excuse me, I K bar is equal to del K bar G I J bar. Okay, so, the, so, so this is a condition that you can derive from, from the first equation. Okay, so, so this is an interesting condition because if you have this equation, then we can actually have a very simple form of the metric and that simplifies many other formulas. For example, the formula for Riemann curvature. So let me write, let me write that for you. So, so what we found is that if you impose these two conditions, one and two, 
then we can have this metric g i j bar metric non-zero non-trivial component of the metric is just this and moreover it satisfies this condition and the complex conjugate do you care if there exists a j in the sense like one and two at all beg pardon do you care if any j actually exists that satisfies yeah yeah there are examples i can give you many okay. examples Okay, so, so let's look at this equation. So what does this equation mean? Well, so for example, uh, in the first lecture, uh, in the, not a couple of lectures ago, we, we discussed the following thing. So suppose you have uh, 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 some vector a mu. And suppose vector a mu satisfies this condition. Is it true that you can always so, uh, write a mu is equal to del mu of phi for some function phi? Is this true or not true? Who thinks it's true that these are equivalent? Who thinks it's not true? Okay, so majority of them, you think it's not true. And that, you are quite right. So for general manifold, this implies that, but converse is not true. Because if you write, and if you write A as some kind of one form, then this equation means, what this equation says that dA is equal to zero. Namely that A is a closed form. On the other hand, this equation means that A is D of phi, namely A is exact. <coughs> and what we just learned last week, <laughs> that uh, closed form is not necessarily exact. The exact form is closed, but converse is not true. But there is this beautiful thing called the Poincaré's lemma that in the local coordinate patch, this is always true. So in local coordinate, if you have this equation, you can always write it that way, and vice versa. This equation is of the same structure, except that we are writing it in complex coordinate. So that means that, although it is not true globally in the manifold, but at least locally, we should be able to find some function which I may call f k bar, so that its derivative gives you gij bar, gik bar, for the same reason, because you, you have this kind of condition satisfied over here. Okay, so we have we can we, so we can do this locally in given each given coordinate patch. We can find <coughs> some f does this, and uh, we can repeat this. I erase this, but there is complex conjugate of this equation. That is that there. J bar G I K bar is equal to del K bar G I J bar. So we have this equation too. So that means that this F can also be written as derivative of something else. So end result is that this G I J bar can be written as del I del J bar of K. At least locally, that is that in each row, in each coordinate patch. We can always do that. So it's interesting. So these two equations look rather sort of mundane, that we are requiring some simple relation for J. But it turns out that if you write it in complex coordinate and massage it a little bit, we found this amazing, well, I think, amazing relation that metric, all the component of the metric tensor can be expressed at least locally in terms of the single function k. So it's so important, so it has a name, it's called Kera potential. So Kera's name is everywhere. So, so what now we have learned is that these two conditions is equivalent that to the condition that metric tensor has only this component and moreover, there is a single function, k, 
so that G can be written in this way. So K is called k potential. The k potential is not a function on the manifold, because if k were a function on the manifold, that would mean that, for example, this k form would be close to exact. Right? So we can actually write if, if k form so if you can write it, like if you substitute this into here, this is equal to i times del i, del j bar of uh, k dz i, which dz j bar. So this means that uh, k is right, written as del del bar of uh, uh, some function k. So if this function k, and in particular, this means that k is trivial, at least locally. And in fact, this lambda would be globally defined if k were globally defined. That would be a disaster. Because uh, in fact, if you raise up k to the power m, where m is this complex dimension of the manifold, then this is proportional to the volume form. I defined the volume form in the previous lecture. So this k form has a property that k to the m is a volume form. So in particular, therefore, if k form is trivial or exact, then the volume form is also exact. But if you have manifold without boundary, for example, then the volume form cannot be trivial because if you have integral of something trivial, then you can integrate away and you get zero. the Stokes theorem. So, so that's a disaster because uh, we, I thought we started with Riemannian manifold, positive definite metric. So therefore, volume, has, volume form has to be positive definite. So if you integrate that, you should get something positive. So, so this will be a disaster. Unless, of course, I mean, uh, the, you have boundary or when you, it, it is non-compact or those kinds of things, that will be different. But generically, that will be a funny thing. So we don't expect for example, compact closed manifold, the k form to be globally defined on the manifold. But on the other hand, on the other hand, uh, locally we can always do that. And then if you change the coordinate, k should transform in certain way so that this kind of relation is still false. So, so that's called the K-Ra manifold. Okay? So how am I doing with the time? Uh, okay. So I have a couple of questions that I would like you to solve. So the first question, I didn't write it on the blackboard, so uh, uh, did I write it? I guess I, I wrote it. Uh, that is that uh, if you, uh, uh, for, for given j, uh, if you define, if you use j, then the uh, coordinates change are holomorphic. Holomorphic. So that was the first question. The second question is about Kera manifold. The second question is the following. So if M is Kera, then that means that you have metric tensor, you, so you can compute uh, the affine connection and write down the Christopher symbol. And I would like to show that, I'd like you to show that there is only the non only non-zero component of the Christopher symbol involved is holomorphic indices only. So for example, you cannot have mixed components. So you have either all holomorphic or all anti-holomorphic. And then yeah, moreover, it has this simple relation. You can write it in this way. So this you can easily prove by uh, using this explicit expression for the Christopher symbol and uh, use this form of the metric. You don't even have to use the fact that it is written as del del bar, okay. 
Okay? So, continuation of the question two. So, so if this is true, then I would like to also to show that Riemann curvature is also simple. That is, the Riemann curvature has only this component. So this is very nice. Riemann curvature is something very complicated in general. But here, you only have one term. So that's another question that uh, I would like to ask you to prove. OK, now I have some, some other discussion of holonomy, et cetera, but uh, in view of time, I'm going to skip that. And then I would like to encourage you to look at my lecture note on the discussion of holonomy of the manifold. We will probably come back to that later. And then I will expand on that when the time comes. So I, I'm going to give you one more computational question. So I asked you to prove in question number two that gamma ijk is given by this thing. Now, question number three is to use this and then to use this metric to show that rich curvature, which is just a contraction of this, is equal to del i del j bar of log of determinant of the metric. So again, this is a very nice simple formula that rich curvature in general is a complicated expression in terms of the metric. But in the case of Kehler manifold, it has this nice simple expression. Okay, any question about complex manifold and Kehler manifold? Okay, so now I'd like to uh, discuss uh, Important, another important concept of the Keller manifold is called Hood's drum cohomology, and that is a generalization of the concept of cohomology of a manifold. So remember that, uh, okay, so let me first write that on the title. In the previous lecture, we discussed Durham cohomology, which is sort of dual of homology that will come later in this lecture, uh, but making use of the concept of closed and exact fold. If you have complex manifold, Kera manifold, we have sort of refinement of this concept, and that's where the Hodge comes in. Okay? So remember what was a k-form. We started out with k-form. The element of k-form was something like this, omega, which is sort of unsymmetric tensor with k indices like that. So this was k-form. And then when we talked about drum, cohomor uh, drum cohomology, what we did was to define exterior derivative on that and consider closed form of that, and we should consider space of closed form, modular exact form. That was Durham cohomology. To define Hodge, we do a refinement of this structure. So what is a refinement? The refinement is the following. So in the case of uh, C of K, the be this was spanned by something like uh, D X mu or I, to dx mu k. So these dx's are sort of basis that we use to generate differential forms. But if you have complex coordinate, then we can have dz i and dz i bar, because you have complex coordinate. <coughs> nice thing about complex coordinate is that they do not mix with each other under coordinate transformation. So that means that if you have differential form like that, it's going to never mix under holomorphic coordinate transformation with another differential form, say, omega bar of dz bar. These components do not mix with each other 
and the holomorphic coordinate transformation. So that means that we can refine this space into this way. So we can consider this as tensor product. We can decompose K into P and Q. And uh, so what's the notation I was using? C, P, Q of M. And what I mean by this is that it is generated by something like DZ1 with DZI of P, which DZ J bar one with DZ J Q bar. Namely, P, Zs, and Q, Z bars. P, Zs, Q, D, Z bars. So that spans this space. But it has to be in such a way that total degree is k. So that's why I have this constraint, p plus q is equal to k. So previously, we had these differential forms, c0, space of differential forms, c0, c1, c2, all the way to cn. But now we can have cpq. Okay, so those are called not so creatively pq forms. So we can have space of pq forms. So omega it is equal to p one over p factorial q factorial is just combinatorial number. So this is a, a differential, uh, sorry, this is a, a PQ differential form, a PQ form. Okay, now, in order to consider cohomology, the important concept was exterior derivative operator. So what was the exterior derivative operator? We had this, first of all, we had this D, which is essentially DX mu del del X mu, namely, take derivative of the co coefficient with respect to x and multiply dx too, right? Now, if you have complex manifold, there is again a natural decomposition of that into two parts, that is del and del bar. So what are del and del bar? Well, it's kind of obvious thing to do. Namely, del is dzi, del del dz i, and then del bar is dz i bar del del z i bar. <coughs> Namely, what it means is that, for example, if you want to compute dz, so let me write it up. So for example, if you have a differential form like that, then if you want to compute del of omega, what you do is you have this p factorial, q factorial, and then del i of omega i1, i p, j1, j p, j q, and then dzi, which dzi1, which etc. all the way to dz bar of jq bar. Understand? Okay? So, del, therefore, is equal to dzi, del, del, zi. Del bar is equal to dzi bar, del, del, zi bar. So, we have a natural decomposition of del and del bar. And the interesting thing is that this thing sort of respects the gradient. So for example, remember D was such that if you have a K form, D of, D of omega becomes K plus one form. In the case of uh, PQ forms, del maps C of PQ into C of P plus one Q, and del bar maps C PQ into C of P, Q plus one. So it's sort of by degree thing. Uh, we can consider conjugate of that also. So uh, remember in the case of uh, 
Riemannian manifold, we have this Hodge operator star, which maps Gk into G of n minus k. We made use of this uh, uh, metric tensor to define star. And uh, so delta co-differential is defined so that it is equal to minus star of D of star. And what it does is now decreases the degree. Suppose, for example, it is acting on CK. Suppose it is acting on CK. Then first you take star, you get N minus K form. You add to D, you get N minus K plus one form. And then you take star, you get K minus one form. So this maps uh, GK to C of K, K minus one. So it reduces the degree. Uh, in the lecture that I gave a couple of weeks ago, I defined delta with a rather complicated sign factor over here. But here I'm already assuming we have a complex manifold. And in the case of complex manifold, if you go back to check your notes or print out my lecture notes, you will find that it is always minus one for even dimensional manifold. So, so with this, we can also define del dagger and del bar dagger. These are simply the conjugate. Well, so one of the things about the D and delta was that, so I should first tell you, that I should first remind you that in the space of differential form, there is a natural inner product. And this D and delta were sort of conjugate, Hamishian conjugate to each other under that inner product. And so with that in mind, we can also define del dagger same, in the same way Hamishian conjugate of del by star del star. And similarly, I can define del bar of dagger to be minus star of del bar of star. And we can do some simple counting to figure out that, for example, this thing maps CPQ to C P minus one Q. And then this thing maps CPQ to C of P Q minus one. So, in total, we have now four differential operators, del, del bar, del dagger, and del bar dagger. That maps PQ form into P plus one Q form, P Q plus one form, P minus one Q form, and P Q minus one form. Let's see if I did it right. It's recorded, so we can check it later. Uh, so, now the question is that, well, so, so we can have these operators so we can have more fun doing cohomology now with respect to both of these operators. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, so it is a question uh, number four. Well, there are some simple equations that you can uh, uh, check. And uh, uh, one thing you can first check is that del square is equal to zero, del bar square is equal to zero, and del and del bar commute with each other. So this sort of guarantees for you that uh, uh, you can consider cohomology. Yes? Anti-commute. Yeah. And uh, 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 you can do, uh, I, I didn't say it, uh, maybe I, I, I wrote anti-commutation, but say I commute, so. Uh, and then uh, we, we can also consider Laplace Beltrami differential operator. So this was initially defined in this way, in the case of a Riemannian manifold. But now, with this, we can write it in two different ways. We can write it in either this way, or we can write it in this way. So basically, we can write down Laplace operator in terms of del and del daga, or del bar and del bar daga. If you go back the uh, my lecture note in the last week, when we discussed cohomology, this was an important point, namely that you can write delta as d delta plus delta d. So that gives you some way of finding representative of 
drum cohomology in terms of harmonic form, the differential form that is annihilated by delta. This property shows that we can also consider similar thing, that if you consider Hodge drum cohomology in the following way. So now, have you written any relationship between these deltas and those script deltas? What do you mean by that? How did you get uh, del delta is equal to the final set of three equal three equals? Yeah. I think I wrote d is equal to del plus del bar. Yeah. And uh, from this, it also follows that the delta is equal to del dagger plus del bar dagger. Then you can do this. Ah. So really quickly, that the d the partial plus partial bar. Yeah. So. One of those maps to C Q plus one Q right. and the other maps to C yeah. P Q plus one. Yeah. So you're adding two guys that are not quite the same. Yeah, but they all so the, so let's see. So so it goes like that. This one goes like this. So in this grading, it's not quite that. So then D, so so it is true. So that means that D maps P, Q into linear combination of these guys. Yeah, so I'm just saying we need some kind of exterior algebra opposed to. No, no, no. So, 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 so remember, D was defined before we knew this structure. Yeah. So, so it is true, well, so CK is equal to sum over all P and Q, so that sum of P plus Q is equal to K. <coughs> and it is true that. If under both of these operations, okay, k goes to k plus 1. Okay, okay. So therefore, okay. uh, this acts nicely on this space, yeah. mapping okay. ck to k plus 1. But this is the refinement of this, that uh, this one maps this into one direction, this one maps this into something else, but in such a way that it still stay, stay within ck plus 1. Okay. Okay, so, so with that, well, this was a nice, what he asked was a nice introduction to what I was going to say, which is to generalize the notion of cohomology. So in the case of HK of M, what we did was to consider space of solution to this equation where omega is K form. But then modulo omega is identified with omega plus d lambda. Now, uh, uh, d is equal to del plus del bar, so we can play this game both for del and delta, uh, del and del bar. So we can classify space as a space, of course a space which is annihilated by del, but modulo something which can be written as del. And we can also consider space which is annihilated by del bar, but modulo. So, so we can do all these kind of things. So since D is del plus del bar, we can refine this space again like that. So this is what is called Hodge drum cohomology. So there are a few important examples of uh, a cohomology elements, so I'd like to mention those. So let's consider H11 of M. So, so this is a subspace of C11, or let's start with C11. So if you have C11 that, for example, the element of this should have this kind of expression in terms of coordinate. And then if you want H11 of M, what we want is that if this is omega, then D omega is equal to zero. Now we have already encountered an interesting example of this kind, that is the k form. Satisfies this equation. 
But I argue that you cannot write it k as d of something else, because if you could, then that means that, well, in particular, if the space is compact uh, without boundary, then the volume of the space is zero, which is contradictory. So, so therefore, k is non-trivial element. So this is interesting. So that means that if you have a Kera manifold, then the dimension of H11 is at least one. At, there's at least one non-trivial element of, the, uh, of this space. But there can be other interesting elements. So I can give you some other example. So in one of these questions, I asked you to prove that uh, if, you, if M is Kera, then the rich curvature can be written as del i del j bar <coughs> of log of the determinant of the metric. Okay, so, so that means that we can utilize this structure to say that r i j bar d z i d z j bar is again closed. And it's not obvious that R is trivial. Because, well, it, although it is locally written like that, but this is not necessarily globally defined function. Because under coordinate transformation, metric tensor, suppose I change coordinate from Z to W as a function of Z, then this GIJ bar is going to transform into G tilde of IJ bar, which is del Z I del W, uh, del Z K del W I, del Z uh, L bar, del W J bar, G K L bar, for example. So, so that means that the uh, determinant of G will become the determinant of G times the absolute value of the Jacobian squared. So since determinant transforms like that, so log of determinant would transform like itself plus something else. So, so this is not necessarily a globally defined function. So it's not clear, it's not obvious whether R is exact or not. Okay, so R may be non-trivial element of H11, the candidate for non-trivial element of H11, but it may not. So it's an interesting question of whether whether this is an non-trivial element of H11 or not. And uh, this contains some interesting topological data of the Kera manifold. It actually is a question of computing the first chancra. The okay. Of course, there are examples where this is trivial. For example, there is a class of manifold which for, for which rich tensor is equal to zero. Because, for example, the entire class of uh, Einstein uh, uh, solution to vacuum Einstein wave equation without cosmological constant is an example of rich flat manifold, namely manifold with vanishing rich tensor. Because you know the Einstein equation in the vacuum is of this form. So it's just say Einstein equation actually simply is saying that rich tensor is equal to zero. So if you so in the case of with zero cosmological constant that is. So therefore if you have so so so, so therefore in, for such class of manifold it is true that rich tensor is equal to zero. So that means that this two form which is called rich form. It's <coughs> also ob obviously trivial because it's zero. So there was a famous question that was posed. In fact, it was initially thought that Karabi proved it, but there was a problem with the proof, so it's called, it was called Karabi's conjecture, which is that uh, if R is trivial, 
in H11. Can we find metric with the same complex structure? with the same Kähler structure. By that, I mean the following, that if you have Kähler manifold, you have Kähler form. Kähler form defines some non-trivial element of H11. So H11 is some finite dimensional space, so it gives you some vector in this finite dimensional space. And that specifies what is called the Kähler structure. So it's a finite dimensional data. So you have a complex structure characterized by J. You have Kähler structure characterized by knowing which element of this Kähler form, what, what, what Kähler form is as an element of H11. So, so if you have these two data fixed, the question is that if R is trivial, can one find metric satisfying this constraint so that R I J bar is equal to zero. Obviously, the converse is of tri trivial true. If I write j by zero, then r is a trivial element of h by one. But proof question is that if you have this, then can you, can you do that? It sort of turns out, well, as you can see, it's a, it's one can think of this as a question about, again, solution to differential equation. Because uh, rij is given by this one. So you have del i, del j bar acting on this thing, and g was also written as del del bar of k. So, so you can think of this as very nonlinear differential equation for k. Question is that is the integrability of that equation guaranteed by the triviality of the k rich form? So that was question. And uh, so that was Karabi's conjecture that was proved positively by Yao. So it's called, so therefore, now the class of Kera manifold satisfying this rich flatness condition is called the Karabia manifold. So in particular, well, this has lots of application in mathematics and physics, plays a uh, very important role, in particular, in string theory. Okay, so so this is sort of, K, this is called the Kera manifold. So, we see that Kähler manifold is defined in some sense starting with two data, Riemann structure and complex structure, and then require compatibility condition of that to uh, 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 generate this kind of structure. There is a generalization of the concept of Kähler manifold called the hyper Kähler manifold. That leads to the, that was led to the following question. So in the case of Kähler manifold, we have the single tensor J that's square to minus one and satisfies some beautiful relation. What if you have more than one J? So can I have several J's? So can I have uh, J1, J2, <coughs> etc. to Jn? All satisfying this, this uh, did I hear anything from the Tokyo side? No? Okay. Is everybody happy over there? Uh, so, so, so is it possible to have n j's all satisfying this relation, g mu nu, j a mu rho, j a uh, nu sigma is equal to g <coughs> rho sigma, and then j a square is equal to minus one, and moreover, uh, uh, covariant derivative of j a is equal to zero, and then j a square is equal to minus one, obviously. So can one, have, can one have more than one complex structure that are compatible with a metric? And the answer to that is completely known. Completely known that, that there are only two cases, namely either n equal one, which we have already seen, the, our old friend Kera manifold, <laughs> or n equal three. That's all, so we cannot have more than well, of course, you can have product of two manifolds, and you can have 
a different thing, complex structure. But uh, if you want to have sort of this structure entangled, then these are the only two possibilities. So this is called a kera. This was called kera in this lecture. And this, has, this is called a hyper kera. Okay, so I just ran out of time, so I'm gonna stop uh, for today. Uh, any question, if you have any question, you can remain. Otherwise, uh, this evening.